All right. So, how many of you all have seen God? Have you seen God? No? How, do, you, do you think anybody has seen God? What about in the Bible? Do you know of anybody in the Bible that's ever seen God? Hmm? Elephants. Elephants, I bet they do. I bet they do. Yeah, I remember a story of Moses. He saw God. And I remember all the disciples. They saw Jesus, and Jesus was God on earth. And so a lot of people then saw God. But, but what about now? Do we, do, we, do we see God? Where would we go to see God? Where do you think we would go to see God? Anybody have any ideas? Where do you think? Hell? Well, maybe. I bet God would probably bring us out of there, is what the Bible tells us and, and what we say in, our, in the Lord's Prayer, doesn't it? Yeah. Where else would we go to see God? Hmm. Well, I have a secret for you. I have this box, and inside this box, you can see God. Do you believe it? No. You don't believe it? What about you? Do you believe it, that if you looked inside this box, you could see God? You believe it? You want to take a look inside this box and see what's in here? Let me see. Can you see God? Can you see God? Yeah? What about you? Can you see God? Look. Oh, can you see God? Can, what about you? you, think you can you see God? No. Can you see God in there? What's in there? What is that? Do you see it? What is it? A it's a mirror. That's right. Because when we look in the mirror, we can see our reflection, but we're made in the image of God. Look at that. It's a beautiful picture right there, isn't it? Yeah. We're made in the image of God. And sometimes it's hard to see that because we think bad things about ourselves or we might not think that we're made in that image of God. But truth be told, we are. We're made in the image of God, which means every time we look in the mirror, we're seeing God. More so, when we look at other people, we have the ability to see God. And we can look all around us right now and see all these eyes staring back at us and we can see God in everybody that's around. That's the hard part. It's because sometimes we don't like other people or we disagree with them or maybe we don't have the same things in common and it's hard for us to see eye to eye. But today we're being asked to look everywhere and find God, which means in the people that are around us. And if we're, if we're even brave enough, maybe we could even see God staring back at us in the mirror. Let's pray. Thank you, gracious God, for being with us today, for making your presence known uh, be with us as we try to see you everywhere. In your son's name we pray. Amen. It's Advent. We made it. It's the best time of the year, right? <laughs> the church is decorated. It looks great. Thanks to all those that got it all put up. And the tree is up. The poinsettias are out. The lights are out. We're getting ready. We are getting prepared for Christmas morning. I'm so excited. My house is already decorated. I got the music going on in my car from that station that's constantly playing Christmas music. And, and my wife doesn't like that. You know, she's not ready for it. But this is Christmas time, right? As we're getting ready for it. We're preparing for Christmas morning. The Advent is all about preparing, preparations, getting ready, making things ready. And it's really hopeful and joyful when we start thinking about the baby Jesus in the manger, right? And we're all getting ready for that Christmas morning. And we're looking forward to family coming together. And our homes are being prepared. And our hearts are being prepared. And the church is being prepared. But Advent is also preparing for something else. And it's not just welcoming the baby Jesus in the manger. Advent is also a time of preparation for when Christ will come again. At the end of all things. At the end times. Which isn't as exciting necessarily or joyful or hopeful as thinking about that little baby Jesus in the manger, is it? Because when we start thinking about end times, our scripture goes kind of dark, and it talks about destruction and, and problems and, and uh, uh, conflict before it all will be settled, and no one's really looking forward to that. So we are going to be talking about preparing, being prepared, and how do we, as Christians, how do we, as people of abiding presence, are we prepared to live a life of faith between the birth of Christ and when Christ returns? Because that's what we're doing. We are prepared for that. We are being prepared for this life of faith between the birth of Christ and when Christ returns. So for this Advent, we're going to talk about stories of, of different people in the Bible. We're going to talk about our story and how they both are interconnected with the story of Christ. 
his life, death, and resurrection in the entire biblical witness. And we're going to use four different weeks to do this, talking about four different biblical characters or writers. And today we're going to talk about Luke, the gospel writer. Next week we're going to talk about the Apostle Paul. Then we're going to talk about John the Baptist. And then the last week we're going to talk about Mary, the mother of Jesus. But today we're going to talk about Luke, who does a really good job of laying down the terms for the end of the world. And we're going to get to that in a minute. But first, Luke was a prolific gospel writer, so much so that he not only wrote one book, he wrote two. He wrote Acts of the Apostles as well, which is kind of like Luke 2. Or if you really wish, and I encourage you to do this because we're going to be going through this, the, this year reading Luke. I invite you to read the entirety of Luke and don't stop until you finish the Acts of the Apostles. Skip over John in the middle. Just go Luke and then the Acts of the Apostles and see how it's all connected together. Luke's a really great writer. He used Mark as a source. And uh, Luke added a bunch of other stories in there, like the road to Emmaus. And then, of course, in the Acts of the Apostles, we have the church beginning and the Holy Spirit being breathed on to the Apostles. But Luke was written uh, uh, for, for a certain reason, and that is to share with us how Jesus Christ is the culmination and the fulfillment of everything that was written in the laws and the prophets. And, and if you need help remembering that, I have a little alliteration that I learned in seminary to help me keep track of what each gospel was about. And Luke's about law, L and L. Luke's about law, the laws and the prophets. Matthew was about Moses, about Jesus being the new Moses. Mark is a minimalist, and John is just plain out there. So that's, that's, that'll help you remember your Gospels. We're going to be focused on Luke. And Luke does. He points backwards. He's inviting us to consider all the ways that the Old Testament talked about the Messiah that is to come, the branch of Jesse, the breath at the beginning of the world, that th this is Jesus Christ and how Jesus fulfills all of these things. And today's Gospel is the perfect example of this. When you read today's Gospel, it happens in uh, chapter 21, and Jesus is about to be arrested, and then he's going to be crucified and risen, and then he's going to appear on the road, and then he's going to breathe on the disciples, the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. But before that happens, Jesus begins to predict the end times. And he starts talking about how Jerusalem is going to be destroyed, and there's going to be all these different signs and these persecutions. It's going to be a party, right? No, it's, it sounds really terrible. And then um, he's inviting them to keep watch, and then he says there will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and on earth, distress among the nations, confused by the roaring of the seas and the waves. It's like it's not just going to affect us. What he's talking about at the end of all things is going to affect the entire planet. It's, we will feel it underneath us so much so that it's even going to affect the sun and the moon and the stars. Everything, nothing is going to be left untouched. And then it says people will faint from fear. Yeah, I would probably faint from fear if all of a sudden we were to feel this, this, this uh, uh, eruption happening underneath us, this feeling all around us. Um, and it says that we'll faint from fear and foreboding of what's coming upon the world, for the powers of heavens will be shaken. So it's not even just the earth with all of us in it. It's the sun, the moon, the stars, and even the heavens are going to feel this moment in time when it all is over. It doesn't really feel hopeful, does it? Not a lot of joy in there. Right now, I'd really rather talk about the baby Jesus, right? But we're not. Let's, let's stay with this for a second because the next line says, And then they will see the Son of Man coming on the cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to take place, stand up, raise your head, for your redemption is drawing near. At that point in time, when the Son of Man comes on the cloud, we are redeemed. And there's the hope. And there's the joy that at the end of all things, we are collected and called home by the Son of Man. But what is the Son of Man? Because it's a term that gets thrown around in the Bible quite a bit. And I've used it before and talked about it before, but I didn't really know exactly where it came from. Does anybody know where the Son of Man came from? Not you. The Son of Man is a term that Jesus refers to himself multiple times in the Gospel of Luke and in every other Gospel. He calls himself the Son of Man. Other people are going to call him the Messiah. Other people call him King or Son of God. They, they call him Rabbi. But the term that Jesus uses to identify himself is Son of Man. And this is important because Luke's writing about this 
And this is pointing us back to the Old Testament because this line, the Son of Man coming on the clouds, is a quote, a direct quote that Jesus is saying as he's identifying himself that comes from the book of Daniel, who was a prophet in the Old Testament. And this guy lived around the time of the Babylonian exile, and he was in prison in Babylon. And while he was in prison, Daniel had this dream, and it's, and it's an apocalyptic end-time dream. And in his dream, he had this vision of these beasts with four heads, and, and they all kind of symbolized the different kings that had taken them captive. And all the people were, were being devoured by these beasts, except for this son of man, this human being that, was not, that did not have the beast overpower him, except this man could overpower the beast. We couldn't do it. The people couldn't do it, but this son of man could. This human being could overpower these beasts. More so that this son of man, this human being that, that, that can overpower these beasts, is lofted up and is seated on a throne next to God, equal with God in God's throne room. So this son of man is coming to save these people from these beasts that are overpowering them. And this would have been good news to people that had been kicked out of their homes, that had been exiled everywhere, that would have given them hope for the future, that it will not always be like this. So we know that this is Jesus when he's talking about the Son of Man because we know Scripture. But Luke not only is pointing back to Daniel, reminding us that Jesus is going to be this Son of Man that is going to save the people from the beasts, but he also points back to the story of creation when he talks about the sun and the moon and the stars and the heaven and also this concept of the beast. What happens in that story of creation? God creates this beautiful garden and gives it to us to, to have dominion over. We are co-creators with God. We're to take care of the animals. We're to take care of the land. And what happens? A little beast comes slithering up to us. And through that temptation, we turn to self, and we do things for our own will instead of doing what God has asked us to do. And from then on out, sets in motion a lot of heartache and trouble and turmoil and chaos as we're kicked out of the garden. And then as you read the entire biblical witness, it's people constantly crying out, return to God. Turn to God's will. Away from your will. Away from that beast that resides inside. Turn toward God. And for a time, people do listen to these priests and these, and these kings and these, and these uh, uh, prophets and these judges. They listen to them, and they turn back toward God, and things go good for a little while until they think they got it. I've got it now, and we turn back to that beast, the self-will, and then things start to happen, and calamity comes, and death happens, and then they, they hear that voice again, return to God, doing God's will, and they turn back toward God, and they find that peace, and they find that serenity turning away from that beast that's within. So Luke is reminding us of all of this narrative from the Old Testament and this one little paragraph saying that at the end of all things, Jesus, as the Son of Man, will sit in this throne room and devour the beasts that are around us and judge us with righteousness. Now that's a hard phrase to consider, judging with righteousness. Um, because I don't know about you, but when I think about the word judge, I think of a courtroom, right? I think of somebody sitting behind the bench, casting out judgment on what you have done or what you haven't done. And they would probably look at Pastor Heather and say, you're in. And they would look at me and say, eh, you know. Uh, but I, 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 would, I would be concerned about that judgment like it's a finality. It's final. But that's not what it means necessarily in Scripture when it talks about save us from the time of trial, delivering us from those types of things. To me, my concept or my understanding when it talks about this judge is somebody that's going to take us and call us or split us or divide us or pull us apart at that time whenever we meet the Son of Man, that we are just stripped apart from those beast-like uh, uh, characteristics from the self-will that we have, and it is tossed away, it is burned in the fire, it is thrown away, and what's left is that beautiful creation that was made at the beginning when we were with God, this beautiful child of God, this, this existence that's meant to be with God and be with the Son of Man and this beautiful, pure thing, this new life. That's a lot of hope to know that when the Son of Man comes, that's the outcome I, 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 can, I can buy into that a little bit more than just all the death and destruction stuff. 
Luke is reminding us that at the beginning of time was God with Christ Jesus. And at the end of time is God with Christ Jesus. And at the beginning, we were made to be one with. And at the end, we are one with. But we're stuck in between those times. How are we to live our life in the in-between? That's what we're prepared for, is to turn away from the self, from the beast that resides inside of me, to turn away from that to seek God's will. And you know as well as I do, that's not easy. Because we turn to the self over and over and over again. We will never get this perfect. We've, we've, we've discovered that throughout the whole Bible narrative. We're never going to get this perfect. And Jesus has already promised, I'm saving you from yourself. I know you're not going to get this perfect. But what are you going to do in the meantime, knowing that you have the ability to turn toward God? Well, being prepared for a life of faith means that every moment that we have can be a sacred moment. Every conversation that we have can be a sacred conversation. Every interaction, every visit, every moment of the day has the ability to be a sacred moment. Whether you're mowing the yard, going to work, kissing your, your spouse goodnight, arguing with your kids and saying you're sorry, these have moments, these are moments that can be sacred moments. The hard part is turning toward God in them or seeing God reflected back at you and the other people or the other experiences and recognizing that if God was in the beginning and God is in the end and God must be right here, right now, God has already showed up. I'm the reason that I can't see it because I'm stuck looking at my own way or my own will. Luke is reminding us to take our will, to align it with that of God's will. And when we do so, look at the people around us and see God staring back at us. I'm likely going to treat you a whole lot different if I think that that's a sacred moment or if I think I'm speaking directly to my Savior, if I think that I'm looking at the Christ in you and the Christ in you is staring back at me. This Advent, we're being prepared for a life of faith. And the only thing that's standing in my way is me. Amen.